So let's get more on these market moves and the dip buying action we are seeing. Ben Ritchie, Aberdeen Head of European Equities, joins us now. Ben, did you find an entry point here? Well, sadly, Katie, I think we found entry, entry points some time ago, and it's been, hmm. it's been quite a tough start of to the year for us. Um, uh, and I think we're probably likely to see a continued volatility as the market digests uh, the sort of shift that we're seeing uh, in the short uh, end of the interest rate curve in the United States. So what is, your, what is your expectation for what the next few months are going to look like? Does this volatility persist? By the way, great to see you in the studio. Thanks for coming in. Does, does it continue? I think we're probably likely to see uh, volatility continue. I don't think we're going to see rotation to the same degree that we have seen over the last three or four weeks. I think it's, that's been particularly extreme. Uh, but I think we will see investors continuing to sort of work out the direction of interest rates. But I still think, you know, even if we do get short end rates at 1%, I think markets, equities of all different types can continue to live with that and perform quite well over the medium to long term. So, Ben, you said this rotation has been extreme. Is this one that is actually going to stick? Because we've been calling for a value rotation from growth for a while, and it always seems to shift backwards. I think it really comes back down to fundamentals at the end of the day. And if, you know, I think you have to look at the performance of banks, oils. You know, these are companies that are backed by improving earnings performance. You know, the environment for banks looks pretty good from a capital markets perspective, from an interest rate perspective, uh, from a fees perspective, uh, for things like the oil sector. Again, you know, energy prices are very high. That's going to be positive for earnings. So you are seeing your fundamentals supporting that. That hasn't always necessarily been the case in the past when people have just been buying low valuations but not without earnings. So I think there is more legs to the support the value side of the market. But I would say on the other side of that, the earnings potential for, say, the quality growth part of the market also looks pretty good. So I think what we We've seen is a catch-up. Uh, we may see a more balanced uh, performance from here. What are the risks to the European growth story? We've got Ukraine. We're thinking about energy prices going higher. Um, we don't know what the ECB is going to do. The expectation is probably nothing. But many people are beginning to talk about the idea that we could see maybe a shift there as well. So where do the risks lie in Europe? You know, I think it's really about perhaps an accelerated reduction in financial fiscal support for the, for the economy. That, that's one area. Again, will we see perhaps interest rates move up a little bit more, a tightening of monetary policy? But I think it's more about global growth, Guy. I think that's probably the area where Europe, that's traditionally been the Achilles heel, that China's been weak, that emerging markets have been weak. Yep. We're much more exposed to that than the United States. So I think if we do see that, that's mm -hmm. probably likely to be the area that'll be Europe's weakness. Is China then actually the biggest risk factor because of its COVID zero policy? Well, I think China is a big driver for European equities. It's a big driver for European corporates. So you know, significant weakness there across the board is going to be relatively unhelpful for Europe compared to uh, you know, the, the, the United States, for example. So that is definitely a risk. I, I'm not sure that the zero COVID policy on its own is the thing. I suspect mm. we'll gradually see that, that ease over a period of time. But you know, right now, I would say, yes, I think emerging markets, particularly China, is a risk to the European story. But you know, China's still doing OK. And the corporates that are exposed to it are not doing too badly either at the moment. So, you know, it's, it's a mixed picture. How do we think about Russia in the context of, of what you've just said? Um, it was interesting. A, a bunch of Italian CEOs today from largely industrial companies had a conference call with Vladimir Putin. Russia is really important to a lot of European industrials. You think about names like Volkswagen. Um, if there is a problem, how is that going to ref be reflected in European stocks? If energy prices go up, which, again, could have an impact on industrials. How quickly is that going to be reflected? I think it's very much, again, a, a question of confidence and sentiment. So I think Ukraine is as much about what might happen in terms of nerves around Eastern Europe as well. It's getting you know, awfully close to where there's significant amounts of manufacturing and logistics that are very important for, for European uh, industrial production. So that's going to be a concern. I think energy prices is a bit of a mixed bag. Yes, initially, we'll see probably see oil prices and gas prices go up. But we're we'll also probably like to see demand fall as well as those concerns spread. So I think there are a number of things. I think people may be a little bit complacent on Ukraine, actually. I think there's a general consensus that nothing is going to probably happen. But I still don't think we've yet seen what it is that Mr. Putin wants to achieve. Uh, and, and we'll be waiting to find that out over, over the coming weeks, I expect. Well, Ben, when we talk about the potential implications of more conflict in Ukraine, specifically as it relates to energy, a lot of the conversation has been focused on the inflationary impact. And I'm wondering how that could bleed through into your world when we're thinking about margin pressure. I think companies are definitely having to work very, very hard to maintain margins in this environment. So they're having to be very, very active on pricing. They're having to work very hard on their costs. They're having to push back 
uh, on their suppliers. I think that all said, you know, an inflationary environment is a much better one for most companies than a deflationary one. It's a much easier environment to work in. It's easier to be able to pass your prices on. And if you're in a position where you're fortunate enough to be able to put your prices up faster than your input costs are coming in, then that's really a pretty good position. And, you know, we saw that last year for all the talk about rising inflation and margin pressure. We actually saw real expansion in European margins and the prospects for this year don't look too bad either. So I think it is a mixed bag, but it can be positive for quite a lot of companies as well. We talked to Stephen Englander a little bit earlier on, Standard Chartered's head of G10 FX strategy. He was talking about his year-end target uh, for euro dollar being 121. We're kind of 112 right now. What are you plugging into your models in terms of valuations? And if we were to see a significant appreciation of the euro, how would that change it? Well, clearly, generally speaking, appreciating euro is, is, is negative overall for European equities, given you know, you've got about half the revenues for the market are coming from outside of, the, of, of Europe. So that's generally going to be a headwind to earnings. Uh, right now, I think it reflects to some degree you know, Europe's economic performance looking a little lacklustre relative to everybody else out there. So you know, I, I think forecasting currency rates is not something that I would ever profess to have a great deal of expertise. We're probably putting in whatever the spot and forward rates are guy into our into our numbers. Do we expect there to be significant deviation around that? I don't think it's probably going to be the key thing for us here. And looking more specifically within in Europe, we were just talking with Francine Lacqua, who's in Rome for the presidential election in Italy, which is now past day three, and we still don't know who the president ultimately is going to be. How would you factor into that into your view on Italian equities? I think Italian equities, are, I think they're a great example, really, of, of Europe uh, in a microcosm in that mm. at the end of the day, there are companies in, in Italy that have been able to perform phenomenally well over the last decade, over multi-decades, despite general political instability and low economic growth because they're dialed into, into globally structural, structurally attractive markets. It could be luxury goods. It could be hearing aids in the case of a company like Amplifon. So we always try and look through that, focusing on the companies. They're very used to dealing with the political instability in that market. They've been doing that for decades. So, yes, it's something to keep an eye on. Yes, might it create a little bit of volatility? Absolutely. Uh, but we're not particularly concerned about the impact of Italian politics right now uh, on Italian equities. Year end, end of 2022. European stocks higher or lower from where we are now? I think maybe a little bit higher from here, Guy, I think. But I think it's going to be a year a bit like we saw last year, where there's going to be quite a lot of rotation. There'll be quarters where certain types of companies are doing very well, other types of companies performing. Uh, I think overall the earnings outlook is still looking OK, and I feel pretty confident about that. I mean, it's been an interesting period because I haven't been through a period of such tough performance on a relative basis while feeling as positive about the companies and their operating performance. So it's really gluing those two things together. I think if the companies we've got in our portfolios deliver what we expect, I think they'll deliver good returns this year, even though it's been a tricky start to the year.